Hello and welcome to this special series on the Goa Inquisition. The series introduces you to the most recent research produced by internationally recognized scholars. I am Dale Lewis Menezes. Our guests will give you a glimpse of their research as well as the research that has taken place over the last 50 or more years. You will hear directly from the experts about the nature of state and religious violence, as well as the challenges a historian faces in, uh, in researching a difficult topic, such as the history of the Inquisition. Our web series aims to educate the general public about the various aspects of this historical phenomena. The web series is supported by the Al Zulej Collective in Goa. Additionally, the series is also supported by the History of the Inquisitions Group, a group of scholars spread across the world with institutional support from the Center for Religious History Studies at the Catholic University of Portugal and of the Chair of the Shephardic Studies, Alberto Benveniste, at the University of Lisbon. We thank them all for their generous moral support. Our guest today is Professor Patricia Sosa Faria. Uh, she is a professor at the Department of History at the Federal U Rural University in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Professor Faria completed a PhD in, the, in history from the Fluminense Federal University in Brazil. At the University of Évora in Portugal, she held a postdoctoral position later. Some of her relevant publications, though in Portuguese, are a Conquista das Almas do Oriente, Franciscanos, Catolicismo e Poder, Poder Colonial em Goa, or the Conquest of Souls in the, in the Orient, Franciscan Catholicism and, and Colonial Power in Goa. And this is a rough translation. Professor Faria will correct me uh, later on if there is some, some discrepancy. Uh, or uh, other publications also include Upai dos Cristãos e as Populações Escravas em Goa, Zelo e Control dos Cativos Convertidos, The Father of the Christians and the Slave Population in Goa, Zeal and Control of the Captured Converts. Uh, and, and lastly, Cruzando Fronteiras, Conversão e Mobilidades Culturais de Escravos no Imperio Asiático Português, Séculos XVI e XVII, or Crossing Frontiers, Convergent and Cultural Mobilities of Slaves in Portugal's Asian Empire in the 16th and 17th centuries. And her main research topics include the Franciscans in Goa, the Goa Inquisition, and, and slaves in Portuguese Empire in Asia. Professor Faria, welcome. Yeah. Hello, Dale. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, for the invitation. It's a huge pleasure to participate in this web series about the Goa Inquisition. Thank you. And, and without wasting any more of your time, uh, I, know, I know how busy you were and you made so, so much, you know, you've accommodated us in your busy schedule. I just wanted to jump right into the, the first question. I want to begin by asking you about your research into Asian and African slaves uh, in the Indian Ocean region, like broadly the region st that stretches from uh, the Cape of Good Hope to Southeast Asia and even to parts of China and Japan. Uh, much of your published work on slavery has been carried out through the inquisitional records, right? And you're one of the few scholars to, to, be, to be doing this kind of work. Uh, I, I'm given to understand that you're primarily engaged in research about the Inquisition. So how and why did you get interested in studying the Asian and African slaves tried by the Inquisition? Good question. Yes, uh, in the beginning of uh, my research in the doctoral uh, research in the following few years, uh, my research dealt with some issues regarding the historical process of Christianization of Goa and the other settlement in which Port Portuguese control in Asia. So in the beginning of my research, uh, the main uh, question is about uh, the role of missionaries and the Goa Inquisition in this broader process of uh, expanding of uh, Christ Christianity in Goa. And uh, when I'm doing the research, I found several, several uh, mentions to captives or uh, slaves in the inquisitorial saucers. And uh, initially, 
uh, I try to understand who these people were, who these captives were, who uh, these slaves were, what meant be a slave in Goa, how uh, I'm a Brazilian uh, historian, so the uh, the research on slavery is massive in my country, but obviously in Goa is not the same thing. So I try to understand a uh, general profile of this kind of slaves, uh, birthplace, gender, uh, the kind of trades they perform, the agricultural, uh, housework. So in the first moment, I try to understand who uh, these people were. These people uh, appear in the, in the inquisitorial saucer and they try to understand precisely who, what meant to be a slave in, in, in Goa, in the other Portuguese settlement in, in Asia. Uh, in, on the first stage, in the first phase of my research, I found more information about the religiosities of the slaves because of the kind of saucer. The inquisitorial saucer has more uh, uh, has more information about that e issues. And one of the challenges of using Goa inquisitorial sources is because the, most of the full trial records uh, has been destroyed. So I need to compensate and uh, try to analyze case summaries, uh, how to say, lists of uh, sentenced people, not the, the entire document. The, uh, the repertory you mean. Uh, yes, yeah, the yeah, yeah. yes, probably in the other episodes, you talk about the repertoire, so important to source for that. And uh, it's in the first uh, phase of my research. And the other way of uh, compensating this question of uh, the full trial records of going to has have been destroyed was doing research with the uh, the Lisbon Inquisition saucers. Why? Because uh, some men and women uh, take uh, from Indian Ocean to Portugal in the 16th century, 17th century, were tried by the Lisbon Inquisition. So I found uh, full trial records whose defendants uh, were enslaved or freed Asian who lived in Lisbon in 16th and 17th century. So in a second phase of my research, I, I began to analyze this kind of sources. And because of that, my, the title of my project, uh, project research was From Goa to Lisbon, because I begin studying the cases of uh, African and uh, Asia, uh, uh, the case of enslaved Asian and Africans uh, based on Goa Inquisition source and, uh, source, and after the Lisbon Inquisition source. And uh, you are correct in thinking about, in the beginning, my studies was a broader question regarding the Christianization of local population after one group, the, uh, one specific group, the slaves. And uh, now I think, in this, I mean, in this moment, <laughs> thinking the, almost the circulation, the displacement of uh, uh, enslaved Asian in Africa from India Ocean to Porto Portugal. Thank you, being a scholar, of Brazil, it's also helped to, it, it propelled you to also think about uh, the issue of slavery in 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 the Indian Ocean, right? Uh, yes, I think uh, indirectly, uh, this kind of a background in Brazil gives me some uh, feelings, things that you'd like to exploit, to analyze, because I have, I'm not doing the same research because the history of slavery in Brazil is entirely different of slavery in Goa, but I think it helped me to think about methodologies. And one of that methodologies is how to, how, how I can we be able to capture uh, aspects or dimensions of uh, the activity, the action of enslaved. I think one of uh, the outputs of a Brazilian scholarship on slavery is especially in the last decade, decades, pay attention to slave 
as an agent, as a historical actor. So maybe because of that, I try to identify who was uh, this person, what uh, the trajectory of life of this person. Maybe this kind of a background uh, highlights some aspects of the social history of Goa because of that. I'm not trying to uh, maybe apply the schemes, the models, because it's not the same thing. But maybe some questions, some methodologies, I think it could help me. As I'm almost in, in a direct way, maybe. Good question. <laughs> let's, let's move on to the next question, which is more uh, pertaining to the topic or closest to the topic that we are discussing today. Uh, I want you to talk about the development of the scholarship uh, on the broad theme of the Inquisition and slavery, right? What, according to you, are the main developments or trends in the slave in the study of slavery through inquisitional records? So, uh, I'm, I'm looking for like the 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 highlights in in the in the subfield of you know slavery and and the and the Inquisition. Yes, uh, I think he, I can go. Uh, we can go on over the last question about uh, how this Brazilian background could help me to think about. Uh, slavery in Goa. In the case of uh, the development of a scholarship based on inquisitorial documents in order to analyze slavery or the life of slaves, I think one, well, one of these developments is the possibility of the inquisitorial sources showing us some dimensions of the slaves agency uh, that is review uh, actions, individual actions or collective actions that help us to treat the enslaved as an agent, a kind of a historical actor, and not as a, an abstract or generic category, slave. But uh, the inquisitorial sorcerer uh, can allow us to capture this kind of dimension. Obviously, the inquisitorial uh, documentation is written following protocols, models, and uh, the speech of uh, slaves is filtered by notaries, by inquisitors. It's not a free speech, but if you use carefully methodo uh, methodologies, it's possible to identify, for example, uh, some strategies adopted by slaves exploring communication networks formed by slaves and the freeds. It's possible to identify how the slaves were able to manage to escape and avoid to be captured again. And uh, the many ways of our slaves uh, using in order to survive uh, in the different contexts in even he built their lives as possible he built in, in a compulsory context, but by marriage and the other way. So studies on slavery based in, on inquisitorial source can allow this kind of thing. I think he, um, more human, more uh, a dimension linked to expectations of slaves, strategies as it was possible as a slave uh, controlled by the master and the other institutions of uh, control. I think a second development is uh, the inquisitorial saucer uh, can allow us to identify uh, life paths, displacements of uh, slaves and uh, the displacement, the movement is part of the life of the of slaves. For example, uh, I think in, in a book, in a book written by James Sweet, he studied the life of Domingos Alvarez, a slave, a man who was born in Dahomey in West Africa. He takes from Africa to northeastern Brazil after to Rio de Janeiro after to Lisbon. So the inquisitorial sources allow us to identify this kind of a displacement. So there are many, many books 
we know it, you can find this kind of information. In my uh, research in Humanities, I, I find Paulo's life fascinating. He's a, um, a man who was born in India. He was a merchant who was captured in the East Africa. And uh, he sold uh, for a man who live in, in India, uh, precisely in Bardez. But Paulo was able to escape and come back to, homeland, to his homeland, marry the woman uh, who had been promised to him before his capture. <laughs> they, uh, they was able to have a son. After, um, unfortunately, he, he come back on a trip to, to go and need, need to Bardez, and he was recognized, arrested by the Go Inquisition, and sent to Lisbon. But it's a life. Uh, uh, amazing, Paulo deserves a book about this life. So this kind of a possibility uh, based on inquisitorial sources. I think it, only the, the <laughs> uh, uh, aspect that I would like to highlight, the studies based on inquisitorial sources uh, uh, also allow us to analyze the religiosities of slaves. And in some moments, it's possible to identify how the practice beliefs of slaves was intertwined with the practice and beliefs of the other uh, social groups in the colonial society and even in European societies. Uh, for example, the book in Portuguese, Metrópole das Mandingas, Black Religiosity and the Portuguese Inquisition and Old Regime, written by Daniela Calainho, is a book in which we can find how this kind of uh, beliefs, practice, magical and uh, healing practice of slaves was uh, intertwined with the practice adopted by Portuguese and uh, freedmen. So, it's another possibility. And finally, thinking in my background in Brazil, uh, the book of Laura de Melo Souza, not literal translation, The Devil and the Land of Santa Cruz, uh, Witchcraft and Popular Religiosity in Colonial Brazil. So I think he, I highlight three topics, but we can think about a, a lot about the possibilities uh, of the developments based on inquisitorial sources. Right, thank you, and that's that's a good sense of what uh, um, what can be done with uh, with the Inquisition sources. So, on one hand, you can think of the slaves' agency, as you said, and the mobility across space, and sometimes this is across the oceans, right? It's like sometimes as large as Goa to Lisbon, and also and also the belief system, as you mentioned, the book by uh, James Sweet on Domingos Alva. It's a biography of Domingos Alvarez, and I think we could recommend it to, to our viewers. It's a fantastic book, and uh, it's a great read also, and it just shows how much um, can be done with these, these kind of archives. Um, I, I want to move to the, to the next, uh, next question and talk about uh, uh, your research more particularly. Uh, in one of your research articles, you talk about, again, the religious beliefs. So I think we can move to the religious beliefs since you made the last point. Uh, and you talk about the religious beliefs and practices of the slaves tried by the Inquisition in Goa. You specifically talk about Islam in this context, and it's something that we don't know much when we talk about the Inquisition in Goa. So could you could you elaborate on this uh, on this uh, interesting uh, connection with uh, Islamic practices and the and the Inquisition? Oh, thank you. Uh, slaves were tried by the Go Inquisition for different religious offense, such as witchcraft, uh, invocation of devil, performance sacrifice, a lot of things uh, labeled as, in Portuguese, gentilidades or gentile rituals, Hindu uh, uh, rituals. However, uh, the main offense, religious offense, attributed to the slaves tried by the Go Inquisition was the adoption of Muslims uh, beliefs, Muslim belief and practice. 
uh, when you analyze the repertorio, uh, the period from uh, 1561 to 1623, uh, about 70% of slaves tried by the Go Inquisition was uh, associated to the Islam. So it's a huge percentage. When do you think about the same period, the all defendants tried by the Go Inquisition, uh, we have 44% uh, uh, were accused by Gentile rituals or Hindu rituals and 18% uh, Islam. So we compare slaves, 17% 70, and they all defended uh, 18% 18 uh, percent. So it's a huge uh, proportion in the case of slaves. That is, so, uh, yeah. so, so, so if I may interrupt, so you're saying, just to be clear, like there is a huge amount of so whoever is recorded as slaves, escravos, they were they were tried for Islamic practices, right? And in this period that you're talking about, uh, the the percentage is extremely high. Uh, could you could you also tell us why why this percentage why the slave population why such a large number of slave population yes. was tried for? Yes, the number uh, the entire repertorio the list the entire list in this period is more than three thousand uh, defendants. In the case of slaves in this period, is more than two hundred two hundred about two hundred forty uh, forty. Is this number? It's not huge. So this uh, this set the, this group of slaves less than three hundred. The entire population of slaves tried by going more inquisition in this moment. Uh, Seventeen percent of them was uh, accused of adopting Muslim practices and beliefs. So. The, um, the total amount of slaves is, I don't remember precisely, two, uh, 214, about 214 uh, slaves, not a huge number in the entire, in, in the total, in, in the, you think about all defendants tried by the Go Inquisition in this moment. Obviously, uh, the humanists do have some difficulties. Uh, I may only count the cases labeled as captive or slaves, but there are other words could be uh, meant a uh, condition close to slavery, for instance, be sure. <laughs> how I don't know how to translate precisely to English because it's not animal, it's not in the, the same sense. Uh, oh, there is some words could be applied to someone who live as looks like an slave. So I only think in these numbers, the 240, the case in, in which I'm sure that were slave. But there are uh, uh, dozen cases more and was possible to be a slave, but the precise word maybe because it was a kind of a housework, slavery is close and mm -hmm. use a kind of more... Uh, right, right. And, and I think the problem is how the historical archive is available to a historian, right? And also the fact that in uh, pre-modern South Asia, there were different kinds of servitudes, unfree labor, yes. so yes. on. So, so everybody isn't a slave, everybody isn't an escravo. Right, there is there is a farage, there is you know there is, there is several there is several things, and so yeah, and so I think it, it's a good 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 thing to just pause for a moment and to also think about the difficulties a historian like you engaged with these kind of limited limited number of sources has to do, and so 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 that's the number that's the, that that's why the number is uh, so so less, right? Or or, or is that? Yeah, in the case, I, I, I realize the number is lower uh, than we, we, uh, we imagine because uh, this kind of a source is only about a specific group of slaves. The slaves usually convert to Christianity and try by the Go Inquisition. But uh, the number of the slaves in each society, uh, Goa or, or the Portuguese settlement in Asia, uh, are higher than this proportion. 
is only uh, the, the repertorio shows us only a specific sample of the slavery in the um, Portuguese empire in Asia. It's a sample. It's not uh, a kind of mirror of the slavery in the different space because I only identify this case. The case of slaves targeted, tried by the Goa Inquisition. And if you think about a question as gender issues, in the repertoire, there are more male slaves than female slaves tried by the Goa Inquisition. It's the other question we can analyze. Why that? It's not why there are few uh, female slaves. It's because maybe what's the action of Inquisition over this kind of a population? So, uh, this kind of uh, questions, the uh, human uh, is, is important in order to become more deep the understanding of uh, slavery and the methodology that you would need to use to analyze the uh, inquisitorial sources. I, when I said this number, about 240 slaves is the only the cases, and I'm sure, but uh, the example you said, Farais, I found many ex, uh, cases of Farais. Maybe uh, the Farais uh, would be uh, an enslaved. So, so why, why, uh, why were these slaves? Uh, why, why, why so much? Why so many of these cases were because of Islamic practices? Like whatever the number might be, but it seems it's disproportionately uh, leaning in, in like. In, in trying is uh, Muslim practices. Uh, what 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 do you think? Why why do you think that is? I think uh, I think one of the reasons there was there was an association between being a slave and being tried by this kind of offense, Islam, and maybe one of the reason is the profile of uh, the slaves in these Portuguese settlements in Asia usually was a man or woman converted to Christianity whose their parents were Muslim or Hindus. And according to the perception of the Inquisitor, the converted people uh, were naturally inclined to revert, to come back to the old beliefs. So the slaves was uh, the slave was converted to Christianity, but the possibility to come back to the Muslim, Muslim beliefs and the practice was huge according to the mentality of the Inquisitor. How is the same case when I think about the studies about uh, the Jews converted to Christianity and how the Inquisition think, oh, the Jews convert, uh, were uh, inclined to revert to the, uh, to the uh, old beliefs né, to Judaism. So it's the same stereotype. That is a, the, in one hand, we have this kind of a perceptions of inquisitors, the stereotypes created by the inquisitors regarding the, the slaves. Maybe one thing, one subject that needs to be analyzed in the future is maybe there is a relationship with the Portuguese mentality. The, who was, uh, who the Inquisitor were? Portuguese who arrived and worked in Goa. What the history of uh, Portugal regarding the relationship of slavery? Until the beginning of the 16th century, the majority of slaves in Portugal uh, uh, were the Moriscos, uh, the Muslim converted to Christianity. So maybe it's a kind of perceptions and the stereotypes maybe project to the India is a possibility. The other, uh, beyond the imaginary or the stereotypes, there is the reality. Goa and the other Portuguese settlements in, in India were surrounded by sultanate Muslim kingdoms. So it's so common, regular, the possibility of the Fugitive slaves go to cross the boundaries and go to Muslim kingdoms and the practices, uh, the rituals, the Muslim ritual, rituals, and after come back to Christian communities. According to the inquisitorial sources, we can see this kind of movement. And if you read the letters of inquisitors written in Goa, it's often, often 
main, uh, they often mention this kind of uh, a movement, crossing boundaries. So maybe there are two reasons, one of the, of the imaginary and the other the reality. Right, and I think that's a that's a good good uh, good sense we get, like why uh, why many slaves were tried for uh, uh, for Islamic practices or Muslim practices, and that's something that we need to think about more, as you say. So, so I want to move on to the next question, and it's about mobility, as you as you mentioned a while ago. Um, so we, I want to talk about a little bit in more detail about about this whole uh, idea of mobility, right? The idea of mobility that historians use to to analyze. You describe in your work the cultural and geographical mo mobility of many slaves, and you have just briefly alluded to it uh, a while ago. I want to know what do you mean by mobility, right? So that's one. Is it is it physical mobility? Is it social mobility in terms of a slave being uh, free from an unfree uh, uh, condition? Uh, one one presumes uh, that a slave would not have the resources or the power to move about or to enjoy certain limited degrees of uh, freedoms, as, as, as you say. Um, so, so what can you tell me, tell us more about this, this term mobility and, uh, and, 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 and what does it tell us about the lives of, of the slaves? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, the notion of a mobility was very important for me, especially in the studies I, I developed in two, 2014, 2016, when the sense of mobility was physical, physical, that is the displacement between uh, territories, kingdoms, societies was physical. Uh, in turn, I assume that the physical mobility favor the development of a cultural mobilities that is the crossing of cultural boundaries, the crossing of uh, religious boundaries. It is the sense for me. And uh, why the reason physical mobility was a striking feature of uh, the lives of slaves. These slaves were captured in our birthplace. They uh, are sold many times cr across oceans. So it's part of uh, their lives, their lives. But in addition to this physical mobility caused by compulsory uh, displacement, capture, uh, selling, slaves uh, could freely uh, escape and uh, go, for instance, from uh, Portuguese territories to Muslim and Hindu territories. Uh, how I said, the Inquisitor of, uh, often reported this kind of a displacement, not only for the slaves, not regarding only slaves, but regarding uh, the converted in general. But in the case of slaves, it's so recurrent to identify the, the slave captured in uh, Muslim or Hindu society. Uh, in the Portuguese society became a Christian. They escaped and uh, uh, adopted Muslim and Hindus uh, behaviors and, and rituals, and sometimes try to come back to the uh, Christian community. So the life is a life of a movement. So mm. the mobility could help me to understand this movement because in your hands, you have the inquisitor, the inquisitor would like to establish rigid, fixed boundaries. In the other hand, we have the life, the, the movement of the life, the movement of uh, slaves. So, so, so if, if I may just uh, ask you to clarify, when you, when you talk about escaping, like the physical crossing of boundaries, and then you talk about crossing, which is a more of, a, let's say, a metaphorical crossing of cultural boundaries. Um, are you are you are you suggesting that it was easy, relatively easy, for slaves to cross these boundaries in that time in the 16th and 17th? Was it relatively easy to do it, given the I, limits? I have some suspicion that it became easier in some uh, 
uh, chaotic or, or difficult situation. Mm. For instance, uh, during an war, during the instability is a good occasion, occasion to escape. In, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a, a lot of uh, remaining full trial records produced by the Go Inquisition, but uh, one of them uh, is possible to identify the escape, especially, for instance, in the invasion of uh, the beginning of the war, and uh, maybe the slaves were able, became able to escape. Or uh, the possibility to exploit what I said, even a kind of a network, a communication network, because um, uh, the slaves, uh, is not only the slaves attached to the land. This, there are, in the case of Goa, uh, slaves who work at the city in, in front of the port. So there is a kind of a communication. So uh, it's very difficult to know precise figures about uh, the, maybe the relationship between the circumstance of uh, escape during the war, during maybe crisis, but there is no possibility. The case of Paulo I quoted is one of the cases that during the war it was able to escape. Maybe at this point, could you uh, give us a little more details about Paulo's life? And I think I, did, I think it would make sense to uh, just have a, have more details about Paulo's life. Uh, is it possible? Yes, I think in the case of a Paulo. Uh, la, uh, Paulo's life is a good example for thinking physical mobility and cultural mobility. And uh, the case of uh, Paulo is good to think about the idea of slave, not as abstract category, because he wasn't. As, he was. He was a, a merchant. He said he traveled to 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 Africa and he had a, a good memory because one, one of the challenges to analyze uh, inquisitorial sources about slaves is the slave usually kept what kept captured during the childhood. So it, usually the slaves erase the memory about the birthplace, the past. In the case of Paulo, no, Paulo had a good memory and he was able to identify the precise historical moments. It's amazing. He uh, was able to say the precise moment in, we, in, in which he was captured in Africa. He said the Viceroy was in Africa trying to control a rebellion against the Portuguese authorities and that matched the, 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 the date reported by him and uh, the date we know about the, the historical narrative. When we go to India, she, uh, she uh, he worked for a fisherman in Bardes, and uh, he told about this moment. He was able to escape during a moment when the Marathas are spacing and uh, the Mughal uh, emissaries are going to, uh, to Goa. So is this precise moment. And uh, I don't know if in some moments, uh, Paulo was a kind of uh, Man, would you like to uh, show a kind of a power of us? Because he told to the inquisitors, he traveled with his brother. His brother worked for uh, the Mughal authorities. So maybe you would like to show a kind of a power in a manner right. to the Portuguese. Yes, right, it's amazing. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so, so where where were, where did Paulo? Where was where was he born? Was he born in uh, Goa or in Africa? India. In Surat is the way to pronounce Surat. 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 So, okay, so so he was born in Surat. So he was from Surat. He traveled all all, all over. Yes, I could share the uh, a small timeline about your life. Uh, about Paulo's life? Uh, yeah, yes. Sure. 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 So yes, could you could you maybe quickly explain the the timeline? Yes, the time, uh, this timeline obvious uh, is approximate data because uh, according to the speech of Paulo and the other information in the documents, I try to put in the timeline, but is not uh, 
uh, totally precisely, but but it's possible to know it, at least this kind of a displacement, this kind of a mobility. Paulo was born in Surat. And, and and just yeah, so he was born in just if I may interrupt again. So his his Muslim name is says Siddi Asim. Yes, he so, was. So born. he 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 wasn't he. He was uh, from the descendant of the African population. Is what well, because uh, uh, he didn't said this kind of information, but because of a seed, maybe there is connection. So, so yeah, the, okay, the okay. Group, yes, maybe, maybe, but maybe. we are not sure. Not sure, no, because okay. there wasn't any precise information about that. But there are suspicion about this kind of a connection between mm -hmm. the African ancestry and. How what he was captured in Africa, maybe there are connections maybe with the uh, local groups. So there is a connection, maybe a, a there is suspicion of links to Africa, but in the document in the trial records, there are few information about that because of the Inquisitor uh, there was uh, paying attention for specific questions regarding the religiosity. So, you, what you can identify, the birthplace, uh, he was born in a Muslim family, the city, uh, Vakanadi. He was captured in Africa, how I uh, as I said. And there are many details about this moment. Uh, he was in, in Africa for some months. After he, he was sold to Francisco Fernandes, and go to Bardez. So he escaped in this moment. And he said this in the moment he, when this emissary of a Mughal empire was uh, in Goa and yeah. during the Maratha's war, <laughs> Maratha war. If, yeah. I, if, I may, if I may interrupt, do we know who Francisco Fernandez is? Can we? The only information in the, uh, in the document is a fisherman and the, the precise village. In, in which they live, uh, Francisco Fernandes and Paulo lived, but no more details. I don't know if I was able to identify the details precisely, the family. So, so as far as we know, Francisco Fernandes is, is, was a fisherman living fisherman, uh, yes. in, in Batis. Okay, okay, yes. all right. And uh, how, uh, and I said, uh, he come back to Surat and uh, when, and he come back to Surat, he come back to Islam and I live as a, a Muslim. Uh, however, uh, he said he was living, traveling, and uh, because your business is uh, this kind of a thing, uh, traveling and selling things, travels in the North and South in India. And after some years, he come back to, to Bardez, he was recognized. And because of that, he was arrested and sent to Portugal. Uh, and uh, faithful for sending Paulo to the, the case of Paulo to Portugal, it's possible to identify this trial. It's, a, it's indeed a copy of the full trial record. So the cases uh, of a people tried by the Go Inquisition sent to Portugal or or that the inquisitors of Goa ask some kind of devices of a, uh, Lisbon inquisitors is possible, is the, one of the conditions to copy this kind of documents send to Portugal. And because of that, we find this information in the National Archive of Torre do Tombo. And it's not good for the Paulo to be arrested, but it's the only way to survive in the archives. And how this kind of people usually Survive into the archives, and because of that, I think it is important to try to to discover not the entire life. It's impossible to write a biography of a Paulo, but to try to show what it meant to be a slave. He's not he wasn't a slave. He was enslaved and had many moments in our life, and he wasn't this condition. The boundary, even social boundary. Uh, be a slave and not a slave and not a slave changing during uh, his life. Right, thank you. One, one last detail I want about Paolo before, before we move on to the next question. Um, why was he arrested by the Inquisition? What was the charge? 
ostensible charge yeah, the he uh, he was denounced by the local population who lived in Bardez mm -hmm. these people recognize him even his former master and uh, the the go inquisition tried paulo by adopting uh, muslim uh, beliefs and uh, practice come back to their original religion and the, and in fact that, he okay. was dressing like a muslim and uh, he in, in his confession he said uh, a lot uh, a lot of information about rituals uh, praying uh, so he obviously there is a pressure to give this kind of confession uh, hmm. before the okay. visitor right but right. he is probably he did that because there are many details about the, the rituals the place maybe yeah yeah so so it's a fascinating uh, life uh, and what you presented and uh, it it also illustrates again your your point about uh, physical and cultural cultural mobilities uh, that you that you talked about so uh, next i want to like talk about uh, more specifically about uh, goa and uh, so your research also talks about a triangular relationship between slavery manumission uh, and Christianity, right? And so this is a time when the uh, a certain institution like the Inquisition is around. And also we have slavery, we have ma uh, we have manumission where slaves are freed. Uh, so what can you tell us about how these triangular relationship worked? And given the fact that the Inquisition was there as a body of control, as a body of a body that disciplined, right? So what how what can you tell us more about this triangular relationship? Yeah, these relationships was complex in the normative sphere the laws uh, encouraged manumission to slaves who convert to christianity the laws especially in the beginning of uh, the 16th century uh, until the middle of the uh, 16th century this kind of laws uh, that stimulated the manumission of slaves converted was part of a, a more extensive, extensive set of laws uh, uh, whose the aims was expanding Christianity in the Portuguese empire in Asia. So it's a part of a, a broader set of laws for expansion of uh, expanding Christianity. And this laws uh, sought to grant some advantages for people who convert to Christianity is the general uh, sense. In the first decades of the 16th century, it's possible to find the letters and the other documents in which bishops encourage this kind of initi initiative, seeking reinforce the expansion of uh, conversion. And if you think about the first Christian communi communities created by the Portuguese, uh, uh, in Asia, there are uh, an, a good part of uh, this population was formed by slaves, slaves, slaves converted to Christianity. But this laws, there is no part that has the laws, there's no material sphere. But obviously, this kind of laws collided with the interests of uh, the slave owners, uh, the merchant of slaves. So these laws were changing throughout the 16th century. And the links between conversions and the grant of a manumission became more fragile, not something strong. Uh, furthermore, is uh, I can do a kind of research analyzing the laws, but it's very difficult to know uh, precisely uh, whether the manumission were actually granted to the slaves, the figures. Uh, we, we find uh, occasional mentions to manumission. That is the letter of a missionary saying about a, a slave boy manumitted. That is mentioned to wills in which the owner of a slave established the slave could be uh, uh, freed, the manumitted after his or her uh, death. But uh, it's very difficult to, to know precisely the connection, the precise numbers of a, a granting of a manumitted. Uh, 
even if you analyze the laws, the decrees, for instance, of the first, uh, of the Goa First Provincial Council, the first provincial council who can read the information. The uh, Portuguese did not grant manumission often. It's very difficult. And uh, they recommend uh, what they advise. The priests and the father of the Christian, the Padre Cristãos, try to convince the Portuguese to grant manumission because it's not so uh, regular, recurrent. And uh, uh, I think in other possibility to analyze this relationship, conversion, manumission, is analyze a very, very important set of sources labeled is known as Goa Letters of Manumission. manumission. Uh, this document was written by the Pai dos Cristãos, or Father of the Christians. In the case of Goa, this position was uh, occupied especially by the Jesuits, and uh, these letter of manumissions we find records, uh, recordings in which there are information about, about boys and girls. And uh, what's the information? These boys and girls typically uh, shouldn't be enslaved because they uh, weren't uh, submitted, subject to not subject a, a just title of slavery. The type, just type, title of slavery is the way to say, according to the Portuguese law, according to Portuguese law, uh, what's the condition to be a slave? If the mother was a slave, if he, someone was captured during a just war, and there are many, many cases of girls, uh, boys and the adults, and had this kind of information, no, it, they wasn't uh, subject to a just slavery, but uh, how the owner, owner, the master of the slave, had bought for him or her and uh, promised to teach uh, the Christian doctrine, it was uh, accept, uh, became acceptable that the uh, men and, and women work for some years before became manumitted. So this kind of a letter of manumission can allow us to think about uh, how the conversion of slaves did not necessarily imply manumission. In the, maybe in the first decades, there are uh, some effort in order to stimulate the conversion in general, in general. but the, the local interest don't allow this kind of a granting conception. Um, so, so two clarifying questions. When you say local interest, it means both the uh, Portuguese as well as non-Portuguese interests in Goa, who obviously non-Portuguese people also had slaves, right? So that's yeah. one. Uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, and secondly, I wanted to know what was the role of the Inquisition in this? Did you see any in any way the Inquisition uh, intervened? when it came to like slavery and manumission? I think only in the, not no. the manumission. I don't remember a uh, precise uh, link because there are two, maybe two big domains according to the law. And uh, who could solve the question of a manumission? It's not a question for the church, it's for maybe the state. What he, was the expectation for the priest, the father of a Christian, is trying to save the soul of the master. If the master had an enslaved in a no legal condition, in a no just condition, it could be a menace for the soul of the master. So what was the expectation of the church? Create condition to convince this master to manumit. So for the, maybe for the religious, institution, it was the role uh, in this moment, okay? It's, uh, I'm not sure about, I don't remember a precise connection between inquisition and the manumission. Okay, thank you. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, another, another question. And uh, this, this question doesn't pertain to the enslaved population that you talk about, but you, but you, uh, but but another set of population, and you and you speak about 
uh, about a person called the Naiks, whom the Inquisitors recruited, uh, and you view them as collaborators of the of the Inquisition and in overseeing its its uh, jurisdiction and its 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 activities. In talking about the Nikes, you you say that the local population cannot be seen solely as a victim uh, of the institutions. Could you elaborate on uh, who is this Nike and uh, and why why do, and how you analyze this person? Okay, first I I would like to highlight social discipline in general. Social discipline depends on the capacity of the control institutions to mobilize local population to expand their surveillance uh, radios, how you said, no? uh, because in the past society, there were neither uh, official mechanism nor enough employees to control, uh, for controlling the entire population. So it's very important to mobilize the local population to create a condition of a self-monitor, a kind of a, how the population can control themselves, their itself. Uh, the maintenance of a colonial uh, power system depends on, on some degree of a collaboration of a local population. And by collaboration, the expulsion of a local population could be granted uh, some advantage, for example, tax exemptions, uh, symbolic advantages, as uh, social distinction. In the case of the Nikes, maybe may have obtained or attempt to get this kind of advantage. So the Nikes, uh, the Nikes was a kind of a diligence officer who could help, who help uh, the inquisitor. Uh, but in regarding the Nikes or the other local population in the collaboration of the Inquisitor, I think it's important to, to highlight how this collaboration also needs to be understood in the context of asymmetrical relations of power, because even a Nike or a specific, uh, a specific resident in Goa hadn't the same power as the Inquisition or the Inquisitor. So it's a kind of a collaboration. And the collaboration, you need to think about collaboration is not precisely a free decision. Sometimes collaboration could be uh, caused by fear or caused because of the lack of the other opportunities. So an, a native, a Nike, uh, had many skills, a lot of skills uh, that could help the Inquisitor. Nikes, as a uh, native, knew the local language the Inquisitor didn't know. Nikes uh, are able to live closer to the local population and because of that, see and control the everyday life in a closer uh, uh, way. However, a single Nike uh, had a little power to negotiate in your, his terms before the Inquisition. So, the participation, the collaboration of, of the Knights, the helping uh, for the Inquisitors, didn't call into question the hierarchies, the social wars. Uh, so it's um, a point. Uh, I agree that the local population cannot only see as victim of the Inquisition. Maybe the local population could receive some kind of advantage collaborating with the Inquisitor. But in these terms, in this broader background, this in which there are asymmetrical relations of power. And I think one uh, uh, challenge thing is, uh, I think in the, in the first, uh, the first impression could be the Nike uh, was a kind of uh, local people, uh, don't think about the oppression for the other local population, but I think the collaboration of Nikes should not be understood as a form of a betrayal to the local population, 
because the local groups did not, not necessarily see themselves as a kind of a homogeneous block. They see themselves as different and able to occupy different positions in the society. So I think in, in our hours, maybe we think in a binary way, in local population, but the reality is more complex. How to survive, how to exploit the possibilities to give a kind of a lower mobile, social mobility. Is, a, a, is a, so important to your question. I think it's very important to think about uh, how uh, the Inquisition needs the need in a kind of a local collaboration, but how was the possibilities for the local population uh, erasing, uh, uh, receiving distinction uh, because of this kind of a collaboration? Yeah, and thank you, thank you for, for this very rich uh, reflection on who this person, who this Nike would be. And, and, uh, and I'm given to understand that we don't have enough information uh, as, of, as of, at least as of today, we don't have enough information, but hopefully sometime in the future, scholars like you would, would enlighten us uh, uh, further. But, but again, I, I think I, I take your point, uh, well, the, the, you know, we shouldn't be like making we shouldn't make it, make it against like it's us was was system like the Nike is betraying uh, betraying the people or there is there is a much more complex uh, history there and and that that I think that point uh, is well taken for now and I think we need to think think a lot more about the, about this issue as well when we talk about the Goa Inquisition. Um, so my final question is uh, a bit of a personal one for you. Uh, could you let us know what you are currently engaged in, what research you are doing right now, and what could we, what could we hope to read from from you in the coming coming few years? Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm currently uh, researching slave population taken from Indian Ocean societies to Portugal, especially to Lisbon in the 16th and the 17th century. Uh, in this moment, I, I analyze especially two sets of uh, sources. One of them uh, is the Lisbon Inquisition trial record, whose defendant were enslaved or freed Asians. Uh, so they live it, uh, they live it in Lisbon or neighborhoods or surrounds of Lisbon in the 16th and the uh, 17th century. By chance, uh, the main of religious offense attributed to him is also Islam, <laughs> even in Lisma. Uh -huh. uh, the, other, the second set of uh, documents is matrimonial petition, sumários mm -hmm. matrimoniais in mm -hmm. Portuguese, mm -hmm. matrimonial petitions uh, produced by Ecclesiastical <laughs> Chamber of Lisbon. Uh, this kind of a saucer uh, is very good for my research. I found about 200 matrimonial petitions in which at least the bride or the groom is from India Ocean, so from the Asia and the East Africa. And uh, what is important to source? Uh, every foreign, everybody who wasn't born or, or everybody who lived outside Lisbon need to prove to not be uh, need to prove they hadn't not previously been married uh, in your home in their in their homeland. And, and in this case, when an uh, Asian bride or Asian groom would like uh, to marry by the Catholic Church, they need to prove that. And uh, because that this uh, the situation because. Uh, the situation they need to apply to a, present a petition or, and uh, try to prove and said they need to say what the, when they arrive to Lisbon, when they leave, uh, where they live, uh, and uh, get and they need to identify witnesses able to prove this information. And because of that, how to prove it? In, uh, in India, well, I wasn't married. I need a kind of a witness, mm. or because I'm one of the slaves or a sailor. But there are a lot of uh, witnesses who also uh, who also 
born in India Ocean, in, in Asia, mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in addition to brides and grooms, it's possible to find a lot of Chinese, Japanese, Indian living mm -hmm. in Lisbon, uh, thanks for this kind of sources. How this kind of sources? I find only fragments of uh, the life of each uh, enslaved or freed Asian. I mean, filling a database, put uh, the information as name, age, uh, birthplace, mm. who was the owner, the parish in which they, uh, they lived, and uh, try to establish a kind of uh, timeline as of the Paulo. Obviously, the sources produced by the Inquisition give more information than the matrimonial petition. But mm. I mean, feeling this kind of research in the future, uh, if it, I would like to systematize, to organize this kind of information, the sparse, this, this different information, and I will try to write a book. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we were able, but would you like to write a book in order to uh, write about this kind of a profile, the kind, this kind of case studies? So it's my project in this moment. Sounds sounds absolutely fascinating, and uh, and and I know that you you're only getting fragments, but those are really precious fragments of information, of biographical data, and I hope that they turn into a book magically. Uh, uh, and I, for one, would be lining up to read that book um, whenever that comes oh. out. So so thank you, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for running us through uh, your research. You began with the Christianization uh, of of or, you know. In, in, in Goa, your research began as such as, as a doctoral student, presumably, and then you found these other people, and then you asked the question, like, who were they, you know, and then it led you on to this, uh, you know, precisely the research that you've done now, and you talked about the historiography, the development of historiography of slaves as slaves as agents, right, and then not just as something that had been acted upon. Uh, what were the slaves' strategies through inquisitional records? Uh, their mobility, uh, their, their, their mobility across across space and across cultural um, cultural landscapes as well. Uh, about how how inquisitional records can be used to to analyze the religiosities and beliefs. And over here, I think we could again mention uh, James Sweet's uh, book uh, on Domingos Alvarez. Um, but you also talked about the, you know the slave stride and for Islamic practices and the problems that that come within in this this kind of research. Um, and again, the mobility about escaping frontiers and how easy or how difficult it was, especially in moments of uh, deep political crisis, wars, invasions, that's when the slaves had had a, had a lot more uh, ease in, in, in escaping uh, to it. And finally, you, you spoke about the Nikes, a figure of the Nikes, whom we don't know much about, but it seems to be a very important figure uh, in, 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 the, in the history of the, of the Goa Inquisition. So for... For all this and, and, and a lot more, I thank you again. And it has been an absolute pleasure uh, learning from you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It, for me, it was a, a huge pleasure. And uh, again, it's a big project, the web series. So I'm very grateful for this uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.